What's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode nine of Toys and Tech of the Trade, your one-stop shop for toys, tech, and talk with some assembly required. I'm your host, Rich Butler, and if this is your first time checking out Toys and Tech of the Trade, just a little background, uh, Toys and Tech of the Trade shines the spotlight on entrepreneurs, creatives, content creators, bloggers, vloggers, you name it, um, and we deconstruct not only the what the origin stories of their business, but also the gear, whether it's the gadgets or the software that they use to run their business, create their content, etc. But of course, on the toy side of things, we shift focus on the things that make them happy, the toys that complete their day, whether it's something as simple as Funko Pops to collecting cars to collecting musical instruments, whatever the case may be, uh, toys in this particular instance should be in quotes. My guest for this episode uh, is a very unique individual. Um, his name is Brock McGough, and he is the editor-in-chief and founder of The Modest Man. It is a blog for men under 5'8". And you're probably asking yourself, what, is, what does a blog about men under 5'8 have to offer me, whether it's because you're over 5'8", or just because you're not into men's fashion, etc.? But... Brock's story is very interesting because when you are under 5'8", and um, I'm definitely under 5'8", for those of you that know me personally, you know that. For those of you that don't, uh, a little a little personal insight. As someone under 5'8", one of the toughest things in the world is trying to find clothes. And as someone who you know grew up in a single-parent household, it wasn't like I was learning, hey, you know, this is the, the right shoes to go with this suit, et cetera, et cetera. It was a lot of trial and error to establish my own style. And as I got older and went into the corporate world, um, you know, I started reading like men's were blogs, different publications, et cetera. And, you know, you try and pull from it what you can. But at the end of the day, you're never going to get a complete picture because a lot of the individuals pictured in these articles and features is not like you. And while, you know, I've been a weightlifter all my life and that's makes a, a different set of complications when it comes to buying clothes. Uh, being under 5'8 is something that, as you get into the professional space, is, you know, it, it's tough. It's tough to buy stuff, especially because a lot of stuff has to be tapered, has to be fitted. Uh, you know, you spend a lot of money on alterations. You just want to look your best. And as someone who was entering into, you know, this corporate atmosphere at the age of 19, uh, after my mom died, I was like, man, you know, I, I kind of I think I got it. But, you know, I'm not I'm not all there yet. So I started reading a, a blog named Mansion. Uh, it's M-A-S-H-I-O-N. And in the midst of reading that blog, I forgot if it was a recommendation from another reader, et cetera, for people under five, eight. They were like, oh, you know, you should check out the modest man. And I started reading it and I was really blown away by the transparency of of Brock's content, you know, the the you know, just getting advice from somebody who made it seem effortless, you know, just knowing, hey, these are the alterations you should look for. These are some of the brands I recommend, et cetera. And in addition to that, Brock gave a lot of insight into how he ran his business. He would share income reports. He would share partnerships, the highs, the lows. And it was something that helped me as a reader connect with him and then that audience, not only because obviously the content was tailored for someone like me to an extent, but also because it was just very, very real. Um, of course, as, as a fan of the blog, I wanted to reach out to Brock and also number one, share his story, but number two, give you guys, you know, that, that 5149, give you guys that value. Um, if you're looking to get into a particular niche and you're not sure if if the niche is going to be successful, you know, you just got to you got to stay the course and work at it because there's there's an audience for everything. There's an audience for people that collect teacups to 
people that collect, you know, funky colored ties, etc. There's there's a community for everyone. And in Brock's case, it not only is a community that was underserved in terms of content and everything else, but it was also a community that when harnessed correctly, not only became a, a strong business for Brock, but also created various opportunities for him as well, including a podcast and a host of other businesses and partnerships. But you know what? Don't take my word for it. Don't let me sell you on it. Let me share with you the toys and tech of Brock McGough's trade. Let's get to it. All right. My guest for this episode of Toys and Tech of the Trade is Brock McGough. Brock is founder and editor-in-chief of The Modest Man. Uh, The Modest Man is a style blog for men under 5'8", and emphasizes looking your best on any occasion. Brock, thank you for taking the time to sit down with us. Thanks so much for having me, man. You, you know, it, it's funny. I came across your your blog years ago, and it was because I was reading um, a gentleman's blog, but his name, I think, was Paul Byrne, and he had a blog out. And, you know, as somebody who's, who's under 5'8", you know, it's always, you know, the thing that jumped out was the opening, you know, the opening explanation for your blog is like listen you want to look your best you can't buy stuff off the rack and you know as somebody being under 5 8 it was it was always a challenge it's either massive alterations or you know depending on what style of clothes you're into um you know you're always you're always stuck <laughs> you're always stuck at either having to jump through 17 different hoops and i appreciated uh what your blog brought to the table at the time and i kept following it um and i really really enjoyed the content just because you didn't try to make it you weren't pushing an agenda you know it was very raw especially because you know you 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 being in the same boat you used a lot of first hand experience to tell the story and and showcase certain brands and certain things you know i like uh you did a a, a piece not that long ago about um bodybuilders under you know sh- short bodybuilders which was pretty cool because as someone who's a weightlifter i i connected with a lot of those guys like franco colombo a lot of those guys so it was very cool to see that I appreciate what you've done in the space, you know? Yeah, man. You know, I, I'm, I'm glad it's been useful. You know, I'm happy to hear that you've, uh, you know, you've been following it for a while. And yeah, I mean, I think, you know, part, part of what I'm trying to do is educate, you know, and just show people, you know, here's some mistakes I made trying to learn how to, how to dress myself as an adult. <laughs> and, uh, you know, especially as, as a shorter guy, you run into specific challenges. And then the other part is just to kind of inspire people. Um, and that's, that's where that kind of content, like looking at some bodybuilders who happen to be below average height, you know, just guys who, you know, maybe they weren't dealt a perfect genetic hand, but they kind of did big things anyway. So I think that that combo of kind of educating people, you know, how to dress well, regardless of your stature, and then inspiring by showing people who uh, who have done big things with their life, um, despite that kind of built in high prejudice. Uh, that's that's sort of what, what my mission is. Now, you know, I want to I want to get into the origin story of of how this how this all you know how you set about just doing this did this just start on a whim was it something that kind of you started it just as a way to vent frustrations and 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 pass on value to others where where did the inspiration come from for the modest man yeah i mean there was it's funny i was actually just listening to your episode with greg um who is is it greg clunas is that how you yep. say his last name yep yeah awesome guy first of all i actually hadn't i hadn't heard of him until i listened to your episode um, really, really cool guy, but his, his origin story kind of reminded me of my own because I got into the the world of online marketing and content creation in almost the exact same way as he did. Um, I was working in a, I had, I graduated from college with a degree in psychology, uh, decided not to go on for a master's and, you know, psych D or PhD. Uh, I was just kind of done with school and I was working in a marketing job. Didn't really know what I wanted to do. And, um, I actually read this book by Tim Ferriss called four hour work week, which I'm sure, you know, a lot of your <laughs> listeners are familiar with ruined my life, that one, right? That book ruined yeah. my life. And I, <laughs> I, I say that in the most positive way possible. Shout out to Tim. I read that book and I just came home and I said, I hate job, you know, just because you, you, it, yeah. was, it was like that moment of clarity, you know? So I, I, I feel you on that. Dude, it, it, the, the exact same thing happened to me where it, it's funny. People, people are so quick to recommend books and that is the only book that I can say actually changed my life. Like I read it and I was like, Oh, there's another way to live. Like people don't have to, you don't have to do this nine to five grind that you hate for the rest of your life. There's another way to do it. Um, 
and it kind of set me on this whole course. But I got into affiliate marketing and niche websites and WordPress and blogging and SEO, got really deep into SEO. And, um, you know, I tried a bunch of stuff with varying degrees of, of failure uh, before I started The Modest Man. And The Modest Man kind of came came out because I was, at the same time that I was I was getting into this world of online marketing, I was still working in like a corporate job and I was not a well-dressed guy. You know, I was dressing like I did in college, basically. Like my clothes were too big. I didn't even know that I wasn't dressing well. Um, you know, people don't tell you that. And when I started caring about my appearance and trying to improve my appearance, I, you know, I went to Google like anybody else does. And like you, I found all these really cool style blogs, but a lot of their stuff I found wasn't super helpful because the actual clothing recommendations they were making wouldn't work for me. They say, hey, you know, wear these jeans and they'd be six inches too long. So I had to learn about alterations and where to shop and how to get custom clothes and all this other stuff. And so I kind of started Modest Man thinking, okay, here, here's a here's a kind of a niche website that I could actually enjoy creating content for. And maybe I could help some other people because if I'm dealing with these problems, there's got to be millions of other guys dealing with them too. Well, that, you know, for me, I, it, it's funny. I remember when I first started reading your blog and I think I posted, I said, I fall into the big and small category, you know, in the sense that I'm five, six, but I've been lifting weights since I was 14. So it's like, you know, I got to get double XL shirts, you know, my, my legs are kind of big. So then I got to go and get pants altered and buy a bigger waist size. So it's it's pretty funny that, you know, when I came across that, I said to myself, damn, you know, this guy gets it. And I think that that's a big problem just across the board. I think that there, especially when, when you're starting a business, you know, you have to you kind of have to niche down to where you're passionate about something because it's in your wheelhouse for you. Like the, that's what made it, like I said, so simple to get into your content. Number one, obviously, we had similarities but number two it came from a genuine place and i think that when when you started this endeavor did you ever think it would get to the where it is now i mean i i appreciate your transparency with revenue and everything else which we'll get into uh in, in a few minutes but i think just just doing that and keeping it so so clear cut th did you want that from the onset or did you want initially just to share your experiences and make recommendations and then you just went down the path of being super transparent? Well, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't go into it with the, uh, like the mission to be transparent necessarily, but I did, I definitely went into it thinking it could be like a, a small, relatively passive business. You know, I, I didn't, I wasn't doing it just for fun. Um, although it was fun, but yeah, I, I went into it thinking, you know, this, this could, this could turn into something. I didn't know how big, how, how, how big the, the potential upside was. And I remember talking to, and you know, I, I, I've been doing this for, I'm in my sixth year now. So it's, you know, it takes a while. It doesn't have to take that long, but it does take a while to build up, you know, a, an online audience, as you know. Um, Hell yeah. Yeah, dude. But, but, but I remember talking to, uh, maybe I was three years in and I was talking to Antonio Centeno who runs a, a brand called Real Men Real Style. And he was one of the first, like other, I guess like bloggers or YouTubers that I had connected with uh, in, in that space, in the men's style world. And I remember him saying, telling me, Hey, you know, modest man could definitely be a six figure business. And I, and at the time I remember thinking like, wow, that would be crazy. Like, no way, you know, like, it, like what would it take for it to, to get there? And now, and, and I'm by no means rich, you know, it, it's, it is a six figure business, low six figures, but now I see that there's so much more potential, like a, a website or, or a digital media company, a digital brand can be a seven figure, an eight figure business, you know? So I, I think, I think you just don't know that until you kind of see it for yourself. Well, I think one of the things that gets me, especially with, with, with things like this is that people, people expect the, the overnight success story. And that's why I like doing these interviews because there is no overnight success story unless you win the lotto the next day. It's a, it, you know, people, people don't see, people see the stake. They don't see the sizzle. You know, they see a lot of, Oh, this is, you know, vicariously through social media, but there's a lot, you know, a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of, a lot of trial and error. I mean, you, you just said it before that you did so much prior and then, you know, you just found what worked for you and, and took off. I mean, when that guy told you that you could, you know, you could turn this into a six figure business, did you, did that just light a fire to say, you know what, I want to see if I can do it? Or did you just figure, Hey, you know, if I build towards it, great. If not, you know, at least it's, it's a, it's a great project, you know? 
that definitely it was definitely a a bit of an eye opening experience. And I remember I was actually I, I talked to my dad around the same time, who's an entrepreneur, and you know I, I told him actually this is a separate conversation, but I remember telling him that the first time I I had a, a ten thousand dollar revenue month, and you know instead of instead of reacting like wow that's I mean he, you know he said that's great, but instead of saying like wow that's amazing, he said he said why not a hundred? Like what would it take? You know, and I think that kind of bigger picture like ten x thinking is very eye-opening. It's a good thought exercise, if nothing else, because it kind of, it makes you think, okay, what would it take to do that? You know, like maybe you have to hire some writers, you know, maybe you have to do something totally different than what you're doing now. So yeah, I think, I think that was a very pivotal time. And, and at that time I was working uh, in digital marketing and I had a, a good job, you know, it was, it was a really good job and it was a fun job. And, um, but, but I knew at that point, the modest man was big enough that I knew my job was temporary. And, and I, every day that I went to work, I looked at it as a fundraising exercise. I wasn't looking at it <laughs> as a career. You know, I, I was raising money for the eventual quit. Nice. That's a, that's a great way to look at it. And I think that's a, that's a very actionable way for, for those of us that are still juggling that, that nine to five, you know, check off all the boxes, uh, lifestyle where it's, you're using your, your job to fund your dream, but you still have to put in the work to chase that dream. I mean, you, you were working, in that space, what was your, what was your work day? Usually an eight hour work day, 40 hour week. And then you were doing yeah, the, yep. the modest man on the side and then pushing it out constantly. Yeah. I mean, I was, you know, pretty much every lunch break, um, either taking calls, you know, for modest man or, or, uh, or, you know, I had a bunch of freelance work on the side in digital marketing, just trying to, you know, raise money and, um, you know, writing, uh, during downtime. And, you know, so yeah, I, I think you gotta, you gotta want it. It's going to take a while. And, and I think that's why it's so important to, to choose a, an industry or a niche that you actually care about because you're if you don't you're going to burn out for sure. I think that's that that's definitely one of the toughest things, you know, that that burnout and you know, I want I want to ask about that, you know, just like the highs and the lows when you were when you were going out and trying to to monetize the modest man, you know, what was you, you know, what was what was probably your biggest high point in the beginning in the infancy of 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 the project not minus all the big stuff that's happened that we'll get into but i mean like that first big break where you were like damn i this is this is the one you know to get the ball rolling yeah i mean the, the first like really cool thing that happened was the first time a, a brand sent me something and i was just like wow this is like a this is a free pair of jeans you know <laughs> like this is amazing yep. and, and by the way i still think like if you look at my instagram story right now i just I unboxed something on instagram this morning i still think it's amazing i'm still super flattered anytime anybody sends something, but, but that was just this, like this moment where I'm like, wow, like I, I have this audience is valuable, like value enough for, for valuable enough for a company to send something for free. The next iteration of that was when uh, a brand said, Hey, can we buy a banner ad space for a month? And you know, that, that was actual money. That's even, you know, it's even more tangible than, than free products because you can use money to, to pay your rent, you know? So that was a really cool moment. Um, and I remember talking to um, uh, another guy who I met like really early on, uh, Aaron Marino, who who runs a channel called Alpha M. Oh yeah, um, I'm familiar yeah, with he's, him. <laughs> yeah, he's got got a huge YouTube channel, and I've I've known those guys for for a long time now. And um, I remember talking to him about you know how to monetize the, this stuff and how to build an audience. And he's really big on sponsorships, so that's kind of that was his advice early on was hey you know start working with brands and. Um, and I, and I got pretty deep into sponsorships for a while, which, which I don't, I don't really do as much now, but, but I do remember the first time that I got like a decent sponsorship, um, with a brand. And it was one of those things where I think a lot of people underpriced themselves. And Aaron had told me, he's like, listen, what, you know, what, what would you charge right now? If like a brand reached out and I say, I don't know, maybe 500 bucks. He's like 2,500. He's like, just say 2,500 and, and see what they say, because the worst they can say is no. And I remember, I remember the first time I, I told a brand it would be twenty five hundred dollars for for a content package, and they said yes, and just being blown away that that would happen, you know, that that kind of deal could happen, and that was definitely like a uh, a turning point. Now, what did that at that time, you know, if you if you can recall, what did that what did twenty five hundred dollars get a brand at, at at that point when you pitched that? So at that point, that was like my top of the line premium offering. So that was like a video, uh, an article. And a couple of Instagram posts and like inclusion in an email newsletter. That was like everything I had to offer in one package. Nice. Well, the thing about that is when when you do do do, do you are you at liberty to divulge the brand or? 
Um, I don't usually talk about the, the specific brands. This, this one okay. was it was a it was, it was a watch company, but all right. Um, but yeah, I mean the the thing is that there's no there's no consistency with like size of brands or uh like different product categories. Like it's totally the wild west of like influencer marketing right now. So yep, you know, I really is. haven't found. Yeah, yeah. So and and what you know with the whole sponsorship thing, I mean some brands like they want to see like immediate ROI. Like if they spend 2,500, they got to get that 2,500 back within 30 days. Other brands, they're like, no, nah, we, we just want brand. Your audience. We just want like, yeah, we just, we just yep. want, yeah, to be exposed to your audience in a way that aligns with our brand, you know? So it kind of just depends what, what the brand wants. Well, you know, it, it, it's funny because I know on, on your site, you know, you, you have some disclaimers about how you handle sponsorships and how you handle certain things. And, I, you know, I, I, I like that because I think that some people, they're just like, oh man, you know, I'm, I got this website. I'm just going to let whoever advertise. Like in, in our case, you know, we get reached out for, for advertising and I don't want to promote gambling on my site, you know, because I'm like, I like, you know, gambling's cool and all, but I have a demo that skews between young and old, you know, so I don't want some young kid to come and, you know, next thing you know, so, you know, they're looking at gambling websites or something like that. Like, I don't want to be part of that, you know, so I kind of skew in that. How do you, you know, when it comes to refusing, you know, how do you, how do you tackle that? Because a lot of people, they're just like, well, just say no. But, but when you're starting out and you're trying to make money, you know, where, where, where do you, where do you draw the line at that point? Yeah, that's, I'd say that's like one of the, the toughest parts of this, uh, kind of like online publishing game, which, you know, I mean, podcasts are crazy popular right now for advertising. I'm sure you guys get, get pitched all the time and, and it is hard to, to turn down, uh, revenue. You know, so I, I think you you have to you know you have to think who who are you like like what kind of person do you want to be and then in a few years when you look back will you be proud of that piece of content that you put out or, or that sponsorship that you took on you know is it something that that you would buy for yourself is it something that you would recommend to a close friend you know and if it's not then then I really think it's it's worth your kind of integrity and and the long term trust of your audience to to say no to to anything that's not like a really, really good fit. Yeah, I respect that. I mean, sometimes like we, we get stuff and I'm like, no, you know, I'm going to pass on it. Um, you know, usually it's, um, you know, guest posts, you know, the old, the old guest post email. And I'm like, listen, you know, we don't want to do that. Doesn't align with what we do. And, and I think that's a big part of what's going on because it's almost like there's not a handbook out there for this. You know, it's like, Hey, you know, start a blog and, it put up, you know, advertising and you'll get paid and you'll make hundreds of, it's like, it's not really that simple. (laughs) And I think that that's a, you know, that's something, you know, watching, watching your journey and, and how you've approached a lot of, a lot of these partnerships and a lot of the way that you talk about brands. I I mean, you know, I saw your, your last um, income report, you know, how you doubled down and started doing more YouTube and doing some of that content. And I wanted to get into that because had, do you feel that there's been a bigger shift now you know, with the, um, with YouTube and Instagram more so than just the written word. It's always, it's always weird because a lot of people are, are divided, but I figured I'd ask you because you've, you've kind of evolved into those spaces on the back of your written content. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what I've been trying to do. And I think, I think video is, is kind of too big to ignore for certain industries. You know, if, if your subject matter is inherently visual, it kind of makes sense to be on YouTube or Instagram. Um, and I, I agree that I, I think it is a little split right now. It's like there are people who read and listen to podcasts and audiobooks, and then there are people who watch videos. And, of course, there's like a lot of middle ground and crossover, but I've kind of found with my audience that the, the audience I built up on the blog didn't necessarily just like rush over to YouTube and vice versa. So the audience that I've built up on YouTube don't really go over to the website very often. And so you kind of have to, to either syndicate your content like across those different formats or, <laughs> or really think like, yeah, or think like what's, what is the best place for this piece of content? Cause sometimes it doesn't make sense, you know, to have the, the same content everywhere. Um, so that's, that's a tricky one, but I, but I think video is very, very important right now. Um, with the, with, with the rise of video, you know, and, and, you know, you mentioned alpha M there's, there's a couple of guys, uh, the, I think it's uh, Zaniga that does teaching men's fashion. Like it's it's funny because you know obviously the YouTube uh, the YouTube algorithm is is cranking it out once you watch one or two videos and and you know the the space the space is very interesting with the people that are in it. But my thing is when when you're trying to carve out your niche, like 
when you started doing more video how did it how did it feel like putting yourself out there visually because that's one thing that people don't get into especially when we're talking about especially you know being under 58 etc you know all this stuff how did you how did you tackle that next facet when you were like you know I got to start doing more YouTube stuff I got to put myself out there because again written a photo here and there maybe a, an event here and there it's a lot different than putting yourself out there and you know millions of people are just going to dissect you the minute they hit play you know yeah i mean you video is like a, a totally different animal for for a lot of those reasons that you mentioned and you know on on one hand i i like it because i think it's it's very hard to it's much harder to conceal who you are on video uh you know it's very easy on instagram or or, or in writing um to kind of create an image for yourself but in video if you're sitting there talking to the camera people are going to know who you are um so that that's a good thing on on the other hand or on the other side of the coin um youtube is just just a, like a cesspool of negativity and trolls you know oh it's it's so bad man <laughs> like it's, like I, I don't i don't know why it's so much worse than other I, I really don't know what what makes it different but it it can be brutal you know i um i read a a, a piece recently um i'm sure i'm sure you know pat flynn um mm -hmm. he wrote a piece about his son starting a channel and like somebody wrote in like the comments this 12 year old boy like oh kill yourself you know like th and i'm like and he wrote about in his you know he asked his son like you know do you want to still keep making videos and that's that's a tough conversation and and his son was like, yeah, you know, because that person was having a bad day. And I'm like, wow, you know, like it just some kid is up. wise beyond his years. <laughs> it, 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 you hit the nail right on the head. I was like, holy crap. But 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 the fact that that, you know, is is out there at, in that capacity is scary. And that's why, you know, with with tackling the subject matter that you do, you know, and, you know, hype bias, because it does happen. You know, it's it, it, it's out there. It, it's interesting that as as you've approached this it's it's tougher man it's tougher and you got to get some thicker skin because i'm sure i'm sure you've got you, you've got a couple of gems in the videos you've put on you're just like oh man there's always got to be one. Oh yeah i mean you, you have so many people just just leaving like hateful comments and you know making fun of your height or, or whatever else i mean honestly it, whatever you look like you're gonna get trolls on youtube and i think w one of the things i try to do which i some of the bigger channels probably just don't have the capacity to do because I, I try to curate the comments a little bit. So, yep. you know, if, if someone leaves just like a straight up hateful comment or, or uses, I have like a list of, of banned words, um, I'll, I'll ban them. You know, I'll delete the comment and ban them from the channel. And because and I, I don't want, when someone's watching one of my videos and they scroll down to the comments, I don't want it to be just a mess. Like I want it to be an actual conversation. I agree. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to do that as long as I can. I'm, you know, hopefully the channel gets to the point where that'll be harder to do. Maybe I'll have to like, get somebody to help with moderation but but right now i'm, I'm handling that good i mean I, i'm glad that you do that because that was my next question you know do you delete them because some people they're just like hey i leave it there warts and all because at the end of the day you know if my audience is as ride or die as as i think they are they're gonna they're gonna take care of it for me and and to a point i kind of feel that there has to be some self-policing you know like like don't get me wrong it's cool if your audience is gonna be like yeah man don't write that don't be that guy and and that's cool and all, but at the end of the day, it's your brand and you can curate the messages and, and the commentary as you see fit. I, I personally am a big believer in just if that stuff is way too out of, out of line, you just delete it. Yeah, I agree. Now, you know, you, you're doing you're doing the site, you're doing uh, YouTube, you're doing the podcast, which I wanted to get into um, the buttoned up podcast. And I want to talk a little bit about that because. Was that the next progression for you? You were like, all right, let's do this podcast. And, you know, I, there's a great story of how you met your co-host, which I want to get into as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I love podcasts. I listen to a ton of podcasts. I love the audio format. I listen to Audible all the time. Um, I always thought about maybe starting something, and there wasn't really anything. There wasn't much going on in, in the men's style world in terms of podcasts. But I didn't have any immediate plans to do it. Um, and it wasn't something that I really wanted to take on on my own. So it was just kind of like serendipitous that John Shanahan happened to reach out, uh, who's you know an, another YouTuber. I didn't even know him. It was a cold email, and uh, I'll have to share it sometime because it was like the most compelling cold email I've ever read, and basically convinced me after one email and a phone call to to partner up with him and start a podcast. <laughs> nice. And, yeah, and and since you know since then we've uh, we've become good friends, and you know we've we've hung out a bunch of times, and um, but yeah, it was just good timing. Yeah, and you're also doing a lot more um, live live events, you know, in-person meetups. I wanted to talk about that. Do you feel that 
that doing those is something that has strengthened your your bond with your with your audience more so than it is because you're pretty you're pretty active on your site just engaging with all the comments i remember you know i wrote a comment and you know within a few hours boom you responded and then you know everybody else was getting comments and i was like all right like this guy this guy's on top of his game you know yeah man i mean dude it's all about the engagement you know i i think i think we get a little bit and what we i mean like you know publishers we get a little jaded by numbers because you know i'm sure you look at your podcast downloads and and you're seeing these big numbers that it it becomes like monopoly money you know you can't even visualize like what is 200,000 people i i don't know yep. it's like a stadium you know and you forget that like when someone leaves a comment like that is one individual person who clicked on your video and watched it and left a comment so you know meeting that person in real life is is amazing and e- even if we do a meet up and you know 20 people show up that's that's like a priceless time I, I i love doing that and so yeah i think that's you know it's not like scalable it's not it's not like a revenue drive or anything like that but it's just like it's just a cool thing to do now you had mentioned when we when we were at the start about you know wordpress and i wanted to get into that because wordpress has seen such a massive evolution as of late um especially on the back end with with the recent updates um did you do you feel that the the flexibility of wordpress makes it so so entrepreneur friendly or is it something where you kind of just jumped into the sandbox because everyone was there and you figured ah this is it and i'll learn it and grow from i think well so so when i started building niche sites like I don't even think Squarespace was a thing. So WordPress was like the default leader. You know, I, I think Wix and some other stuff was around, but WordPress was just better. And I think the main, for me, the, the main thing that set it apart was it was just so so easy to focus on SEO with WordPress. Um, it's just a very like clean platform and it's fast and secure and, uh, you know, kind of open source. So there's all these plug, there's a plugin for everything. Yep. Um, I still think it's by far the best platform to build a website. Uh, I, I used a, a theme for like, I don't know, four years, you know, and then finally got a, a custom um, website developed. But, you know, I, I think I think people get a little too hung up on the the way their website looks and they don't spend enough time on the content because, you know, you can have the coolest, uh, like most flashy uh, user-friendly website in the world, but if the content sucks, it doesn't matter, you know. Agreed. And on the flip side, you can have amazing content and just a plain text website, and still going to be popular. Yeah, I think I think I I went through that phase, you know, because my my brand originally just started as just a brand for the podcast I was doing, and then it just snowballed into so many other things. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to make this site look like this, and then you start asking people, well, how do you like the site, and blah blah blah, and how does it look, and they're like, well, it should look like this, and before you know it, you spend three months trying to figure out what you want to put in the sidebar and you know that's three months that you're not doing content so so i definitely you know it's um paralysis analysis i got caught up in that quite a bit now i just you know i'm a i'm a little bit more uh split with how i do things like "Eh, if it looks okay and it doesn't look too terrible i just keep writing you know and putting out content yeah i mean i think i I heard uh, i can't remember who said this but i I heard somebody say, basically, if you're going to do something, you know, ask yourself why three times. And so like, if you're sitting there, you know, it's, it's Monday morning and you have a to do list and you find yourself tweaking like a, a widget on the sidebar, you know, maybe it's because you don't want to do something else in your to do list. But ask yourself why you're doing that. And it probably comes down to some other reason. You know, it's like maybe the real problem is that you need more traffic. You know, in that case, the widget's not going to help with that. Right. You got to you got to make some content. <laughs> so. Or, you know, do some email reach out to do guest posts or something. So I think a lot of the times that that can be a distraction. Um, not to say that it's not important because the, the look and feel of your brand and the UX, it is important. It's just not the most important thing. You know, you, you mentioned email and, and I wanted to talk about that because, you know, your 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 emails are always your your newsletter email are, is always very nice, very neat. And I wanted to get into that because a lot of people and, and I'm uh, I, I made that rookie mistake. They They just bombed when it came time to to build that email list is the email list now in 2019 still as vital as it was five years ago in your eyes you know i, I think a, a lot of people would say yes i'm i'm seeing a, a bit of a decline in email um and n- like a number of subscribers that, that i get every day and open rates click rates and i don't think it's it's a it's bad or you know i don't think it's like a scary thing that's happening i think people are just 
choosing to follow you elsewhere, like on Instagram and YouTube. So yeah, I, I guess the, the short answer is is no, I don't think it's as as valuable as it used to be. I still think email is really valuable and it's worth doing. But um, you know, if, if you have an email list with fifty thousand people, you know, you might be able to get a maybe a couple thousand or a few thousand people to your website with an email, but you're not going to get 50,000 people. Right. That's where, that's where there's the disconnect with that. And the reason is because I kind of got into it late and I'm like, man, I gotta, I gotta build this up and I gotta figure out how I'm going to send it out. And if I'm going to do it weekly and then it becomes a thing of what you want to put in the email because you don't want to be ultra spammy with it. But you know, I like, I like how you do it because especially your, your, your last year recap email was really good because like, Oh, here's the, here's, you know, if you want to read this income report, go here. If you want to see this here, you included some personal snippets. You kept it very, very concise. And that was my, my next question. You know, when you're when you're putting together your 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 email, how how do you how do you determine what's going to go in there? Obviously, you want to put, hey, the most recent posts or whatever. But how do you curate your content for that audience without making it seem like an overabundance or just giving them too much? That's a good question. And, and honestly, I, I don't know if I'm doing if I'm really doing it the optimal way, I mean, I know a lot of people will send an email and, and they're, I think, I think the kind of the traditional approach to email is like have a really compelling subject line. So they open it and then have like one call to action, right. you know, click this link, read this post. I, I don't like the, the clickbait subject lines because I think it's, it's like a downward spiral. Like once you do it, you have to keep doing it and it gets more clickbaity and you see this on YouTube too. Yep. So I, I want people on my email list to know that they're going to get every week or every two weeks, they're going to get an email that summarizes the content that was published since the last email, you know? Right. So it's going to say, Hey, since you, since you last heard from us, you, you know, we've got two new articles and one new video. Uh, and then in every email, there's going to be a little section for, for deals. So like, Hey, here's three deals that are going on right now that, that you can check out and that's it. And so it's more of like a digest. And if you don't like it, that's fine. Um, if we have like, you know, if I get lower open rates because the subject is just descriptive, it's not like exciting. That's fine too. <laughs> but I think it's a more sustainable and kind of more honest way to do it. You know? No, I, I agree. And I think, and, and that was where, why I was asking that because it's exactly that the clickbaity titles and YouTube, like I said, is, is good for that. I mean, even the news uses that as well. It's like, Hey, is the milk you're drinking every day killing you? And then you're waiting to see and waiting to see, and they save it for like the last 15 minutes of the newscast. And you're like, Oh, this nonsense. Yeah. Turns but, out. No, it's not killing you. <laughs> yep. That's, that's exactly it. Um, I wanted to switch gears a little bit and definitely talk about, you know, the bread and butter of, of the modest man. And that's, that's men, men's fashion. Um, you know, with the, especially here in New York, you know, New York is a, is, is definitely very, very interesting when it comes to fashion because it's a, it's a combination, you know, a little bit of business casual, a, a lot of streetwear uh, over the last, you know, as, as, depending on where you're at in New York and, um, you know, just a lot of comfort in between. And I wanted to talk to you about that because I wanted, especially now that you're in New York more frequently, you know, how do you feel about that? that division in terms of how fashion is portrayed in the big apple. I think it's so cool, man. New York is, is one of the best dressed cities in the world as far as I'm concerned. And, and every, every time I go there, I just want to up my game, you know, <laughs> like just to keep up with people because I feel like people in New York just, I don't know that everybody's expressing themselves with what they wear yep. versus in other places, like only like a small percentage of people seem to care. So I, I, I really love New York for that reason. And, you know, I, I think the merging is really cool. It's, it's, to me, it seems kind of like the way music has gone. Like we're there are genres, but there's also like a lot of blending between genres, and some some music doesn't even really fit into any genre. Absolutely. I think that's kind of yeah, it's kind of how style is now, and and that's I think that's super cool. Where do you you know where do you stand with like the you know the streetwear aesthetic? And I ask because a lot of people that a lot of a lot of style blogs they're kind of like, eh, hey, you know, don't go out wearing your, you know your joggers and your sneakers. Like this is how you got to wear this for this. Like like very, very regimented. And I wanted to ask, um, you know, just as someone who's, who's definitely still a streetwear guy. I mean, I was a, I was an eighties kid, you know, and then crafted in the nineties to, to, to be finished off. So, you know, it's, and a New Yorker to boot. So it's like, you know, Timberland jeans and, 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 you know, b yellow construction boots. That's like a, that's like the default uniform, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you gotta, I mean, that, that's the thing about, about the clothes you wear, like you have to like them. They have to make you feel good. And, if they're not, then you're, it, you're just doing it wrong. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what anybody says, you know? So I, I think, 
and I, I used to, my, my advice used to be much more prescriptive like that. Like never wear brown shoes with a black suit, never wear blah, blah. And it's like, I try not to do that anymore because it's, it's like, first of all, wear whatever you want, you know? Yep. But I, I, I do think that you should, you should dress within the parameters of like an occasion that you're going to. So if you're going to a wedding, you should dress within the parameters of Agreed. of that dress code, a- add your own personality to it, but like know the rules, you know? And once you know the rules, you can kind of play with them. So, you know, the streetwear thing, I'm personally, it's, it's not part of my aesthetic, but I have, you know, nothing but respect for people who are into it. Well, you know, it, it's funny because the, it, it, there's such a, 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 an interesting dynamic, like, you know, especially in the sneaker culture, like, you know, when, when Jordan did the sneakers with the patent leather on the, on the front, you know, you saw people wearing them with their tuxedos and wearing them to the prom and, and don't get me wrong, you know, I love, I love a pair of, of Jordans as much as the next guy. But to your point, it's like, listen, I'm not wearing a pair of Jordans to, to my prom, you know, or, or listen, yeah. man, I'm not wearing, you know, when I got, when, when my wife and I got married, everybody's like, oh, you know, you, cause we got, did a destination wedding. They're like, ah, oh, man, you know, you could wear like some Converse. I'm like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, nope, not doing it. And so, so I, I, I definitely respect that because I think that that's the, that's the problem. I think that you still have to respect some of those, those timeless occasions where, it's like, listen, you got to put on dress shoes. You got to put on a suit. You have to, you know, it's like, like you just said, add your little tweaks, you know, maybe you want to add some cool socks or a, or an awesome bow tie or a cool pocket square. But, but listen, you got to, you got to wear the stuff, you know? Totally. Totally. Yeah. I mean, like an example of that would be, say you're going to someone else's wedding and you're, you know, you're a menswear blogger and like, you're really into it and, and you love dressing up. But if you're going to someone else's wedding, like you shouldn't show up with like, a super fitted suit with like double monks and no socks and a pocket square and a tie clip and a watch. And like, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't show up like trying to steal the, the groom's thunder basically like have respect for the occasion and, and kind of kind of know your role. And it's, it's okay to, to maybe add some interest to your outfit or maybe stand out a little bit, but I think it's just important to, to kind of know where you are and, and then, uh, you know, re- respect that. And then you can kind of add your personality in, in a more subtle way. I think that, you know, that's the, the, that originality and keeping that, keeping that part of the aesthetic alive is where people kind of get lost. And it was funny because I was talking to a buddy of mine and we were talking about that when you go to school, you know, they don't teach you how to do your taxes. They don't teach you how to balance your checkbook. They don't teach you, they don't even teach you how to cook anymore, you know? And it's like, I think for men and for women, you know, at least a business class or just learning how to, once you get into that real world, like what you said, just, Hey, you know, like, what am I going to wear for a job interview? Like, like, you know how many times I used to ask like other people I knew, like, Hey, I got this job interview. What do you think I should wear? Because that just doesn't exist. I mean, now, obviously in 2019 with the internet and everything else, there's countless people, you know, guys like you and others that are putting out great content, just pointing people in that direction. But there was never, ever a blueprint growing up. Like most of us, you know, we kind of looked at our dads if, if we had one, you know, as, as the, as the, as the style to follow or kind of a general idea. And then, you know, obviously TV and everything else influenced it. But I feel that growing up, that was something that was just lost. You know, it was a lost art form. Nobody knew like, Hey, you, you know, you got to wear dress socks and these are dress socks and these are, you know, loafers, you know, everybody was like, ah, my grandfather wears penny loafers and that's it. You know? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's totally missing from from education. You know, there's just basic life skills. And it, it's funny because we kind of look back on the days where, you know, they had home ec class and, yep. and wood shop and all that. And we're like, oh, that's so, so outdated and so old school. It's like, no, I actually would love a home ec class. <laughs> like, man, I'd love to know how to cook and have my own pants. <laughs> that's why that's why companies like HelloFresh are making so much money because nobody took a home ec class. <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> that's the that's the niche right there i mean you know my mom i remember she taught my she taught me how to cook and my brother how to sew and that's how she did it she because i just I'm, I'm not good at it <laughs> she was like you're gonna learn this and you learn this and you kind of meet in the middle and it was because you know those were those were skills we just didn't have and don't get me wrong you know my brother can can stitch a button or, you know do something very quickly but it's a valuable skill to have and it's just something that's so lost now it is. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah. And like basic accounting and just like, just like the basic life skills. How to do your taxes? You know, <laughs> like, yep. I don't know why they, they don't teach that stuff. Nope. Credit, credit being the big one. 
oh, we're not going to teach you about credit. And then when you get out of college and you applied for seven cards when you were, uh, at, you know, at the admissions office because they were outside setting up tables, if you remember that those days. Right. Oh, yeah, totally. That's why I got my first credit card, man. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> I, I'm, you know, I wanted to switch gears before we jump into the uh, into the hot seat. You know, I wanted to talk about your partnership with with Peter Manning. Um, you know, I, I remember when you put out the post announcing that and, um, you know, I said to myself, damn, you know, that's 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 a product of hard work. Um, you know, the, the, the origins of that partnership are within that post, but I kind of wanted you to share a little bit of that story with our audience just to show, you know, how, you know, how far that hard work brought you. Yeah, totally, man. I, I had, um, what, what I mentioned earlier in, in, in our interview, I wanted that first company to send me free stuff and that first company to buy, buy banner ad space that, that was Peter Manning. And so when I first started modest man, I didn't know that this clothing company had started out of New York by this guy named Peter Manning, um, that was for men, uh, five, eight and under. And at the time, uh, there were a couple brick and mortar shops that focused on the shorter guy, but there was really nothing like it, no online company. And, uh, so, you know, once we found each other, it was like, wow, this is a match made in heaven. And, and they, they bought advertising that first month for, I think $200 and they haven't missed a month since then. So they've been my long, longest term advertiser, super loyal, um, a perfect fit because I, I was wearing out their clothes all the time anyway. Um, and what was cool about them is, you know, they didn't just, yeah, they wanted traffic and, you know, they wanted the exposure, but they'd send stuff just asking for feedback. So like they'd send a pair of chinos and say, hey, what do you think about like the leg opening, you know? And so we, we kind of were working together that way, like way before it was official. Um, and then, you know, fa so fast forward uh, like five years, I've met the Peter Manning team a few times. Um, you know, they've continued to, to increase their ad spend. They've grown a lot. Like they have a whole clothing line now. And last year I was thinking about starting my own clothing line. Cause I'm, I'm thinking, okay, how do I take modest man to the next level? You know, like right. I don't want to do, I don't, I don't want to just keep doing sponsorships. Like I need a product, you know, I need, I need to turn this into an actual business. And, um, and so I, I was considering starting my own, my own clothing line and, uh, for partnering with somebody else. I was talking to a couple of potential partners and I talked to the guys at Peter Manning and, you know, they were like, Hey, why don't, why don't you come work with us for a while, you know, and, and, you know, kind of get your, get your feet wet in the, in the, the industry, see how clothes are made at the back end, the supply chain and, and the product development side of it and, uh, and help us with digital marketing. And so, yeah, we made that official. And I think for, let's see, since like May of last year, I've been going up to New York once a month, helping with all that stuff, product dev, photo shoots, digital marketing, and it's been awesome. That's it. It's an amazing culmination of such such a such an you know an awesome journey, and to see that, and to see you you know be involved on on such a, a you know an intimate level with a brand that kind of believed in you from the start is just a great way to kind of bring everything full circle. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. Yeah, it, it is. I, it feels like it was years in the making, and I'm you know really happy with the partnership so far. So I I think there's so much there's so much growth uh you know there's so much potential with peter manning and already doing really well but um it's just such a we, we always say that uh the you know the world doesn't need another fashion company but they need this one because this market is so underserved and it's uh it's not uncommon to see people having like emotional experiences in, in the showroom and it sounds funny because we're talking about clothes but you know imagine like a 55 year old guy who's like literally never put on a shirt that fits and his wife drags him into the, the Peter Manning uh, fit shop in, uh, in New York and he puts on, you know, she forces him to put on a shirt and it fits perfectly. I mean, I've seen guys tear up, you know, because it's like they just feel like they've been ignored for so long. So I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. Yeah, it's 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 such a, a crazy, a, a crazy thing, you know, especially because it's like you go out there and it's either too big, too small, too tight, too loose. You know, it's, a, uh, you know, I, I everybody jokes about it like like, you know, everybody who's who's five, six wishes, wishes that, you know, they had a, a Goldilocks moment where everything is just right, you know, like right. just right shirt, just right pants. And it's, and it's funny because, uh, you know, like if I buy a pair of sweats and they fit perfectly, I'm like, damn it. Now I got to buy six pairs of these because they'll probably stop making them. And, and next thing you know, it's like, wow, you have a lot of gray sweats. Yes, I do. <laughs> you know, like, yep, like yep. That, <laughs> that, that's how it goes. And, and it's crazy too, just because, you know, finding exactly that a company and a brand that represents 
you as an individual so well is just it's it's hard to find because everybody's just you know it's it, it's a one size fits all world and unfortunately that's not how it's supposed to be i agree all right so you know i think that's a good way to close things out and take us into the hot seat um for those uh that aren't familiar the hot seat is a series of just rapid fire questions nothing too crazy um that allows us to just learn a little bit more about our guests and get some insight into, you know, what they do for work and play. So, you know, as somebody who runs a business, you know, obviously your mobile devices is, is paramount to that. Um, you know, what are you using? Well, I, I have the uh, iPhone 10 or is it the iPhone X? The, the iPhone, the iPhone 10, iPhone 10. I have the iPhone 10, the regular one, not, not the big one. And, uh, yeah, I really like it. It's a great phone. Um, when you turn on your phone, what are, what's the first app you go to? Oh, man. Um, let's see. On my home screen, I've got Reddit, <laughs> uh, Gmail, YouTube, Kindle, and, and I've got my, uh, my Hue lights. Nice. Those are, those are, those are pretty good. Um, are you a laptop or a desktop user? Uh, laptop. I got a 13-inch specced out MacBook Pro. Nice. And you do all your video editing and podcasting, uh, I'm, I'm assuming, right through that, right? Yep. Yeah. That's like home base. That's why I do everything through. And I've got a, uh, at the studio, I've got a, a 4k monitor that I plug it into. Nice. Um, for, for your podcast, um, you mentioned you edit with Adobe audition, right? Yeah. Yeah. I record right into audition, do a little bit of, uh, editing in there. What's your favorite piece of tech besides your phone and your computer? Oh man, I'm, I'm loving my camera. I actually just upgraded from a, uh, a, a Canon rebel T six I to a Panasonic GH five, which is like, you know, going from like a Honda to like a Mercedes. So that's been fun. <laughs> yeah. That camera's intense, especially because it doesn't have a recording limit. Oh which yeah. Is nice. dude, it's, yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> nice. That, that's very nice. Make sure you get yourself a, a speed booster um, adapter for lenses. You, you know, I, I need to do that. Right now I'm using native uh, Lumix lenses, but yeah, I, I got to get that speed booster. Yeah. When you get that, it's, it's, it, it becomes a whole other ball game. Mm. Um, do you work with or without music? I usually work with instrumental music, uh, just kind of background music. What's uh, something that you've purchased recently that's under $100 that's made your life easier or more enjoyable? Oh, man, that is a, that's a great question. Um, let's see. You know what I, I, I find? So I've, I've been like sprucing up the studio, and I finally got this like clothing rack, and it was just a cheap one from Target. It was like 50 bucks, and it's it's great. So that you're nice. going to start seeing that in videos because it's, it's awesome. <laughs> nice. As, as long as it works for you, that's, that's the name of the game. Um, obviously, it wouldn't be a, a toys and tech podcast without talking a little bit about toys. Um, what was your favorite toy or collectible growing up? Growing up, I, I, was, I was into the X-Men cards. Nice. Yeah. I had the whole, the whole series two, almost the whole series four. <laughs> that, that's pretty awesome. It's funny because a buddy of mine, you know, I collect comics and I actually gave him my X-Men cards and my series one and two of Marvel, the Marvel cards with the holograms. Oh yeah. Those holograms are sweet. Oh man. Those, and, it, and it's funny too. Cause people go crazy. They're like, wow, you still have those. I'm like, yeah. And I, you know, I gave those away just cause I'm downsizing a lot of that stuff. Um, what's something you collect now besides, uh, clothes? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I definitely, uh, I, I collect watches, but not, not in that I try to, I try to have a lot of them. I just try to have like a super curated collection. Nice. But, um, but yeah, I do. I am into watches. Uh, which, which are the brands of choice for, for watches? Right now, my collection consists of, uh, Seiko, uh, Hamilton and Rolex. Got to have that one, that one Rolex to, you know, put on for those special occasions. People are like, oh, Rolex on, very nice. It's you know, it's funny, man. You know, when I, when I got it, I was like, oh man, like it feels like this, like bling, you know, everybody's going to uh -huh. notice. No one, no one has said anything. No one notices. The only people who notice are other watch people. Yep. And they're just like, you get the little nod, like nice. You yeah. Know? <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. There's a, a podcaster. He's a, a, a personal trainer, uh, Jason Ferrugia. He goes, listen, you know, nobody, you know, you could wear sweatpants and a t-shirt, but you got a nice Rolex on, man. You know, it's like people know like, exactly <laughs> what you just said. You get the nod. Like they know, like, yeah, you know, this guy, this guy's about his business. Right, right. Yeah. When I see someone else too with like, it doesn't have to be a Rolex, but just like any, any watch they've clearly thought about, they're clearly into watches. I, I always say something because I, I know that, you know, they care. So I'm like, Hey man, nice Hamilton or Oh, cool Seiko, you know? Nice. Now, um, what's a, what's a, a, a big style mistake that a lot of people frequently make? I mean, n number one for sure is just wearing clothes that are too big for them. Um, pants that are too long, sleeves that are too long, or just like, just one size too big. Honestly, just like most guys just need to size down. 
Okay. Um, what are three must have men's fashion essentials you recommend? I think one would be the uh, Oxford cotton button down OCBD, which is, you know, just a kind of a thick, uh, casual button up shirt, um, white, gray, light blue, you know, some, something neutral. Uh, another one would be, uh, some sort of like minimal sneaker. Like I really like a white leather minimal sneaker or something, something like common projects, but you could, you could go way more affordable than that. Um, if you don't like sneakers, I'd say that the flip side of that would be like a boot, just like a brown leather boot. Uh, that's number two. And then number three for sure would be uh, dark wash denim. Nice. Um, with, with that, you know, any, any particular brand you're, fa- you're a fan of for, for denim? Uh, well, I, you know, self-promotion here, but I like Peter Mann just because it, um, they have a, a skinny fit that uh, fits me really well. And you can get it in like a 26 or 27 inch inseam. So I don't need to hem it. Um, but I think most guys will be able to find uh, something from Levi's that that'd be like my budget option uh, that fits well because they have so many different cuts. Um, Uniqlo is also a really good option. I actually started messing with them a little bit. It's weird just because their stuff is cut very small. But um, I've been getting a lot of their uh, you know their cold weather uh, essentials because I hate wearing coats. So you know I get like the like the the heat gear. Like, heat tech uh, yeah, yeah. The heat tech the, the base <laughs> layers and stuff like that and just throw that under a sweatshirt and i'm good for the day yeah dude same i, I don't like wearing like giant parkas so i'll just wear like three layers instead <laughs> nice um what's a, a company that people should look out for obviously besides modest man that you're watching too um are we talking like content creators or like in uh, general just a company that you're like you know that's a company that's that's got it together just it doesn't matter the space just the company you feel that that's a company to look out for yeah, I think, well, I, th- I think on YouTube, I mean, definitely want to shout out to a couple, like, I want to say up and coming, but they're growing so fast. They're not, they're not small channels anymore, but Shoot. there's a channel uh, called Huga, um, H U E G U H, which is really, really cool. Uh, just awesome production quality. There's another one, um, Tim DeSaint, which is similar. These are both men's style guys, but just like really fun videos to watch. Okay. Um, and then in the, uh, clothing accessory space, um, I really like, uh, there's, there's some really cool new shoe companies. Um, Thursday boots is, is a favorite of mine. Um, great, uh, Koyo, you know, basically anytime you're about to buy like a shoe, like look for these smaller direct to consumer brands because they're offering a lot more value than the department stores these days. Nice. All right. Last, last question. Um, if you could have dinner with anyone alive or dead, who would it be? And what would you have? Hmm. Man, that's a great question. Alive or dead. Jeez. Well, all right. So alive, uh, it, it would for sure be Tim Ferriss. And I would, I'd just buy him whatever he wanted to eat and just say, thanks for writing four hour work week. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Pro- probably get him some, uh, some red wine and, and some like Argentinian steak. I think that's probably what, yeah, <laughs> what he would want. That's about right. <laughs> um, I, I think, uh, dead, I'd, I'd probably have dinner with my grandpa. Um, okay. Cause yeah, I, I was a teenager when he died. And now that I'm, I'm older, I'd, I'd want to, I'd have a whole new set of questions I, I wanted to ask him and, he was he was Irish, so we'd we'd probably have a uh, have some whiskey and like I don't know like potatoes or something. <laughs> nice. little, little bangers and mash. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> My wife is part Irish, so yeah, I know I know I know a little a little about that. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> All right. So um, as always, you know, we try to add you know obviously besides the interview and our and our hot seat questions, we like to add a little value. So we we have a section called Reach One, Teach One. You know, as as someone who has built a brand from the ground up and you know are slowly reaping the fruits of your labor you know what's something you could tell somebody that's that's just getting started you know that's actionable that they could start today so i'd say assuming like your basic needs are met like you know you're not uh you're not in crazy debt like you know you've got food on the table um don't don't waste time like if if you're in your your 20s especially don't waste time doing stuff you don't want to (laughs) do you know like don't don't stay in a job that you hate um don't even worry about like getting a big salary or something in your twenties. Um, if if you have school debt and stuff, try to pay it off, but like, just don't worry about the money at that point in life. Um, I'm not saying not to save money, like definitely have a 401k IRA, max it out. That's part of your basic needs, but just don't stay in a job you hate, you know, try to actively find, find what you actually like doing and then try to get really good at it. And if you don't like something, move on. Um, cause I, I think, the twenties, twenties and thirties are just so precious. And I wish someone, I wish I had spent less time in my twenties doing stuff I didn't want to do. 
And that's a that's a that's a that's a hell of a piece of advice right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. It's tough though because you feel like you need money and mm-hmm. you know you, everybody else is doing it. And but it's just twenty is a, is a time to experiment and and find yourself, and uh, it's not a time to become a career person. <laughs> no, it's a, uh, you know, it's funny. I, you know, fight club is one of my favorite books and you know, it's funny about books that we've read that have changed our lives. You know, it's, uh, doing a job you hate to get money you need to buy things you don't want. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Things you won't end up owning you. <laughs> that's it. There, there you go. I think that's a great way to close things out. Brock, I, I really want to thank you for taking the time to share the toys and tech of your trade. I appreciate you having me. Thanks. All right. That wraps up our interview with Brock from the modest man huge thanks to him for taking the time out of his busy schedule to give us some fashion advice some business advice and everything in between uh we'll have links in the show notes for this episode uh of where you can find brock and all of his content as well as some of the recommendations and items that were mentioned in the interview some of those items may be affiliate links as always full transparency uh if you purchase something through those links we may get a small commission, which of course goes towards giving you guys a better experience, whether it's video, audio, or written on the site. I always want to keep that out there and let you guys know that your support and your purchases go towards making RageWorks bigger and better for each and every one of you. In two weeks, we're going to continue the RageWorks creator series, and we're going to be sitting down with Call Me When It's Over's Josie's Boy. Um, It was an amazing conversation. We're going to talk about not only his art, the birth of Call Me When It's Over, but a lot of the brushes, paints, and other things he uses to create content, both on the canvas and on the air. Uh, It's going to be an exciting interview. I look forward to sharing it with you guys. Uh, For those of you that are going to be in the New York City area and are covering Toy Fair, Rageworks will be there uh, the weekend of the 16th through the 18th. So if you are planning to attend and would like to meet face to face and either, you know, catch up and talk some toys or anything else, feel free to look me up. Um, you can always find me on Instagram at RageWorks. We're going to be sharing audio, video, maybe a couple of Instagram lives from the event. Uh, one of those days I'll be joined by Jimbo Slice as well. So we're going to be giving you guys content uh, all through the course of the event. Uh, if you're a fan of action figures and collectibles, etc., uh, you're definitely going to want to keep it locked to RageWorks this coming weekend to check out all of our content from the Toy Fair floor. As always, you can keep up with RageWorks on social media. As I said, you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, etc., but the best way to reach out as always you can is to email me rich at rageworks.net or use the contact form on the site. If you'd like to be a guest on a future episode of Toys and Tech of the Trade, feel free to reach out via the mediums I just mentioned and we will definitely set something up. I want to thank all of you who have been supporting this brand new podcast, um, downloading the episodes, sharing your insights and giving me guest recommendations uh, definitely making a note of some of the people you guys would like to hear about on future episodes. And we're going to definitely do our best to get as many of them on as possible. Thank you guys for checking out this episode. I'll see you guys in two weeks. Peace. <laughs>